Braxton Garrett has not been good. He should be a big part of this rotation moving forwards. But do you trust him? And who do you trust looking forwards in this Marlins rotation? This Marlins team and organization is built on pitching. But looking at things right now, is it all falling apart? Tons to get into. This is Locked on Marlins. You are Locked on Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England and welcome to Locked On Marlins. This is your daily Marlins pod. I'm your host, Peter Pratt. Hit me up, of course, at Miami Marlins underscore UK. If you're listening to the pod, firstly, hello and welcome to Thursday's episode. It's the 13th of June. The Marlins lost a game yesterday evening, but they have another one on deck this evening. That's the beauty of baseball, no doubt. Uh, this is your team every day, of course, and thanks for making Locked On Marlins your first listen. I truly appreciate it. Make sure you hit subscribe and leave a review. This show is available wherever you get your pods. And reminder, there is a YouTube channel. Make sure you hit subscribe. Join me on the YouTube. Comments in particular. Let me know your thoughts, feelings, and how you're seeing this Marlins team now. One eye on the present and equally one eye on the future, of course. Uh, in terms of today's episode, I want to talk about Braxton Garrett in particular. Boy, oh boy. Braxy's had one stunner and a load of duds around that. What's going on with Brax? Equally, I think we should kind of take a step back and look at this Marlins rotation generally. I know Sandy, I know Yuri, not available this season. But boy, oh boy, some of the guys that you expect to lean on haven't been delivering. Who do you trust? Yesterday's game as well was like a throwback to like the first two weeks of the season. Defense was not there. Maybe that's why Brax struggled uh, as well. I also want to talk about smoking Joe Brazaro uh, and another appearance for him on the Marlins 9 podcast. Loving the show from Jeremiah on that one. Make sure you're checking out that show uh, for sure. It's always great to have, you know, more Marlins coverage, more Marlins content. And for sure, Jeremiah and Joe Brazaro, that too has been straight up fire the last couple of weeks. Smoking Joe uh, coming in extremely hot, no doubt. I want to talk about that at the back end uh, of this episode. And as well, the other thing to call out, someone asked me on, you know, on, on Twitter earlier on, so I wanted to kind of follow this up, I guess, on this show and just kind of like add a little bit more context. There was maybe a sense that the Marlins aren't in a rebuild at this point, and I should stop considering why we need to trade everyone. And I get the point, but I, I thought we were all aligned in terms of the Marlins being in a rebuild. He then asked me, he said, well, how do you define a rebuild? So I want to talk about that. Like, are the Marlins actually in a rebuild, irrespective of what language is used by the front office, irrespective of what PR spin the organization looks to put out there? If we're honest with ourselves, are the Marlins actually in a rebuild? Let's talk about that. And it's going to be at the back end of this show. This show is brought to you by our good friends over at Tax Network USA. Uh, and, and today's episode of Locked on Marlins is brought to you by Tax Network USA. And did you know that it's never too late to resolve your tax issues with the IRS? Don't wait. Reduce your tax debt and get help from a team of licensed tax professionals. Call 1-800-549-1000. Or visit tnusa.com slash locked on. All right, guys, let's start with yesterday's game, last night's game. Braxton Garrett was on the mound. The Marlins were looking to take the series against the Mets. They may be a little bit jet lagged, those Mets, after a trip to London. And boy, oh boy, Braxton Garrett, and you know, what has been a stereotypical start in 2024 for Brax, just struggling to get going with his with his starts. Yesterday, really, it was compounded with, you know, listen, Frankie Lindor, he sees him well. Uh, Rod Allen was talking about that on, on the broadcast to say, like, Frankie Lindor is just seeing Brax well. Like, it's a tough matchup for Brax there. He pings, he pings one, like, maybe second, third pitch um, of the game. It was relatively middle-middle, I would say. Middle, lower middle, let's call it. Pings won. It's fair to say that Jazz was close to it. Could he have got there? 
maybe, maybe. Uh, when I originally saw it, I was like, okay, that's just over Jazz's head. But then when you kind of go back and see and you look and you think, actually, did he misread it? Was he giving it full gas? Immediately, if he gave it full gas, would it got it? Listen, the ball landed and hit the bottom of the wall or just in front of the wall on the warning track at kind of like left center. It was drilled. It was drilled. Jazz got close. And was that because Jazz is athletic? Or could Jazz have done more? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Someone will have a stack cast number somewhere that says catch probability was 70% and actually Jazz fumbled it or actually catch percentage was like 2% and Jazz just got close because he's a freak. I don't know. Nevertheless, it was not the start they were looking for. And then it's fair to say the main mistake, I, I guess, overall, and this kind of set things off for Braxton Garrett, was effectively middle-middle to Harrison Bader. And he absolutely pulverized one, like completely demolished it. Brax will want that one back, no doubt. Two-run shot, got the Mets going. Um, it's, you know, Brax kind of like got into the inning from that point. But then in the second inning, the defense absolutely hurt Brax. And so this wasn't self-inflicted in its entirety with Braxton Garrett. The defense definitely did not play. Definitely did Braxton no favors. In particular, I'd say there's two main plays. The biggest one of all of them was Manny Rivera. It was straight at him at third base. He had to kind of come in, but it was like a casual pace. There's no excuses for Manuel Rivera to not be making that play. I think probably in his head, he's thinking, can I turn two? Can I get there quick enough to turn? Like his head was probably working faster than his glove. And then by the time the ball arrived, he was like, "Uh uh-oh. And you know, ended up making like a silly mistake. Otto Lopez later in the inning had one drilled on the ground towards him. It was one of those tricky ones, in my opinion. Again, at like first glance when I watched it earlier, it looked like one of those where it takes a bounce very near to the grass meeting the dirt, that kind of like lip area where, as we know, it can take little funny bounces, little hops, little low bounces, whatever it might be. I'm not making excuses for Otto Lopez because he's been good at second base, but that looked to be what could have been the cause for that. Nevertheless, it hurt Brax. Later on as well, Otto Lopez completely lost track of how many outs there were, tried to turn a double play when there was only one out required. And so I don't know if Otto Lopez was fully switched on. I don't know if he was having a bad day. I don't know if maybe his confidence was knocked a touch because of that, that error. It could be. But nevertheless, Braxton Garrett, the type of guy he is, the type of pitcher he is, you know, he needs his defense to back him up. And the defense yesterday fully let Braxton Garrett down. No doubt about it. But we can't get away from the fact that Braxton has just not been as effective this year. Not by any stretch. And I think in our heart of hearts, as Marlins fans who were pretty much all out on Braxton Garrett at one point, He then emerges last season, starts in the pen, moves into the rotation, and was top draw. Top draw. When he, you know, gets to the the postseason and Braxton Garrett's going in Philadelphia, I wasn't panicking. I Brax deserved that. He deserved to be pitching, you know, in that series. No doubt. Like Brax was so good last year. In a league that is all about Velo spin rates, etc. Braxton Garrett is like the ante of that. He's almost like kind of like, like a throwback, but he does it his own way, but he was super effective. He had that filthy slider that would get so many swinging strikes, so many, you know, stri- strikeouts looking as well. Particularly that one to the right-handed hitter, he'd started outside and it would just kind of just keep tailing in and in and in and just kind of clip the zone. Out looking, then you'd have the one buried towards the kind of back foot. They're swinging. I think JD Martinez got done on one of them yesterday as well. That's the Braxton Garrett that we know. Four seamer, sinker that's working, slider in, sets up the outside of the plate as well. We're just not seeing that from Brax this year. And the question has got to be why? Why are we not seeing that? What has changed for Brax? Has the league adjusted a touch? Is he just not getting the movement, the spin? Is he just not locked in enough at this point? Like, 
I get it. He's been hurt. He's working his way back. You know, is this still kind of spring training vibes? I don't know. There's quite a few questions. Let's carry on this conversation around Braxton Garrett. I also want to talk about the rotation more generally because you have to look at who was projected to be in the rotation, how they're performing at this point, and really ask yourselves the question around the Marlins pitching. <clears throat> is it actually as good as we've built it up to be? So tons to get into uh, in this conversation, no doubt. Before we do that, let's start with our good friends over at Prize Picks. Yes, sir. And guys, you know this one, no doubt about it. It's America's <clears throat> number one fantasy sports app, and it has more than 5 million members. It's the most fun, exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less than on two or more player stats for a shot to win up to 100 times your money. And with prize picks, you can turn $10 into 1000 in a single game watching your favorite sports this summer. You can make a prize picks lineup in as little as 60 seconds. You just need to pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and you're locked in. And there's always action on prize picks and it's the easiest and it is the perfect time, sorry, to try out something new as basketball is winding down. Make sure to try out eSports this month because for every Wednesday and Saturday in June, if your lineup doesn't win, you'll get your entry fee back. Choose the Counter-Strike 2, Call of Duty, League of Legends, and more. So what have you got to do? You got to go and you've got to download the app today. The app is Prize Picks, and you got to use this code. It's locked on MLB. That gives you a first deposit match up to $100. Reminder, download the app, use the code locked on MLB. Gets a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And this episode is also brought to you by our good friends over at Policy Genius. Yes, sir. A lot of life is unpredictable, but a good life insurance plan gives your family a financial safety net to protect against some of the unknowns. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace. It makes choosing the right policy for your family quick and easy. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options are 100% online and let you avoid unnecessary medical exams. So Policy Genius helps you easily compare your options from America's top insurers in just a few clicks. Their award-winning agents can even walk you through the process step by step. Your work life insurance policy may not offer enough protection for your family's needs. And even worse, it may not come with you if you leave your job. So get peace of mind by finding the right life insurance with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. All right, guys, welcome back here to Locked on Marlins. It is Thursday, the 13th of June. And you're with me, Peter Pratt. We are talking about Braxton Garrett. Unfortunately, another Brax clanger, a clunker. I mean, post-game, post-game as well, Brax was severely dejected is how I would describe it. I think Kelly Sacco asked him, did the line, was it, you know, did the line do you justice? Were you better than what the line suggested? Brax, his head scrambled. Completely scrambled. He didn't even know his line. He didn't know where it finished. He had no clue at that point. Just dejection. Completely unsatisfied with the start. And he spoke about it after the game, how he felt like he let his guys down, put him in a hole again, considering the offense was kind of doing okay against the lefty. And listen, against lefties, it has been so tough for this Marlins offense. But again, the Marlins drop another game against the lefty. I don't know the... I don't know the count right now against lefties. Is it now 2-20 and 20 or something crazy? Man, I, I don't know, but either way, it is pretty wild. But the offense was getting stuff going yesterday, and I think that makes it even worse for Braxton, where 
he really probably felt that he didn't give his team a chance to win, which isn't usual for Braxton Garrett. His record, the Marlins record when Braxton Garrett pitches is really encouraging. They win a lot of games normally with Brax. So it may be one that they just flush and move on. Like I said, the defense really did not help Braxton Garrett at all. Uh, obviously ended up with four earned runs, but gave up six in general. So a couple of unearned there for Brax. And that has a huge impact, right? It really does. And so I'm, not, I'm definitely not laying all the blame at Braxton Garrett's door. But when you go and look at his profile, like you go to Savant and just see what's cooking. I think the main thing that stands out to me, like I mentioned, when I go back to 23, what do I think of for Braxton Garrett? I think of that wipeout slider. That's what I think about. I think about that slider just being like right inside, getting tons of swings and misses. Like the ball ends up way off the plate. But it's just filthy, that slider. When you look at the whiff percentage on that pitch, specifically last year, um, which was his second most thrown pitch, 41% pretty much whiff rate on that. When you look at 24, it's down way down to 28%. So it's got a 12% drop-off in terms of whiff rate there. For me, it, it really shows up and really plays um, and, and it definitely, you know, an issue this year. Um, so I think, you know, the slider definitely isn't playing as much. I think when you look at Brax's profile more generally, though, like there's, you know, there's a lot of hard hit rate in there. There's a lot of hard hit balls. There's a lot of high exit velo. There's a lack of walks. I guess when you kind of go and just compare the high level bubbles or sliders, however you look at it, um, from year to year, 23 to 24 for Brax. It isn't totally dissimilar. 23 is, it, you know, it looks slightly better, but 24 is, it's a very similar pattern. And I think that's the thing with Brax. It's always been, I think, I was trying to make this point earlier, um, but I went off on a tangent, which is standard. I think in our heart of hearts, we've known there's regression kind of coming for Brax. He was stunning last year with the opportunity that he was given. He worked his way to be a starter in the postseason series for the Marlins and, and completely deserved it. But if you were to say to me, who's going to regress potentially? Because, you know, listen, year to year, things happen, things change. Who knows? Like, that's just baseball, right? It's a bit like these relievers. Um, you know, year to year, things can change and do change. And I think I look at it and think, who's most likely to regress? I, I think the numbers would have said probably Braxton Garrett because of the type of profile. If, you, if you're working at the bottom of the zone and you give up a ton of hard contact, don't walk anyone, so that's great. Limits the base runners. And you rely on your defense. Like, considering the defense is step backwards and considering, you know, you make a mistake, you know, with balls being hit as hard as they are, it's going to do damage, significant damage. And so... This doesn't totally surprise me around Brax. I can absolutely see him returning to former glories, if that's the way we want to phrase it. But this doesn't totally surprise me. Equally, I don't think clearly that it helps that he, he's he been hurt. How much of an impact is that having, having on him? We don't know. Clearly, he hasn't had his typical offseason, his typical spring. He ends up with like, the longest possible rehab because that's what he needs to do, right? To kind of build himself back up. He comes up, he's under a pitch, you know, being limited in terms of his workload. He then throws a Maddox in the middle of that. But around that, it's not been good for Brax. And that's his own self-analysis is, you know, there's been too many crappy starts and he just hasn't been good enough. Not giving a team the chance to win. Brax will come back. Brax will find it. I'm convinced of that. But I'm not stunned at this point. Should we panic? Should we panic about Brax? I'm not sure panic is maybe the right way to think about it because, you know, what, what is Braxton Garrett? What should his, you know, role be in, in you know, in a Marlins rotation? And really, you, you have to say that, you know, with Sandy and with Yuri and, you know, you know, as you put it, and Lazardo, obviously, but we'll see how, what, what Lazardo's future holds. But, you know, with those guys, you know, you're looking at Braxton Garrett being like a kind of mid to bottom part of the rotation. 
And if that's the case, that's fine. I think the challenge we've had here is Sandy Yuri and maybe Lozado. I mean, those two are hurt. Um, Edward Cabrera's hurt. Sixto Sanchez is hurt, but I mean, that is what it is. You're now looking where, you know, Brax is kind of bumped up to like the two, right? Weathers is hurt. And I think, I mean, he was able to make it work in 23, but I think if if Brax is your two, then there's a there's probably some trouble in terms of the Marlins rotation. I mean, who do you trust in this rotation? I think this is a really interesting topic for the Marlins kind of going forwards. You know, I, we don't know what the future holds for Lozado. You, you clearly trust Sandy, but, you know, he's he's been hurt now. He's, he's had Tommy John. He's going to come back. We're going to have to look to see what Sandy Alcantara is now. You know, after a regression after his sigh, then getting hurt, like we're a couple of years removed from that Cy Young campaign that we all f- so fondly remember. But what what is Sandy now? What's he going to be? Big question mark. Yuri Perez, only a small stint in the major leagues. And I must say, whilst the numbers were immense and at times Yuri looked immense, I have to be totally honest, there were some big flies that Yuri Perez gave up. Big flies. and. For me, with a touch more, you know, a touch more, if you're a touch more unlucky, let's say, in that situation, in those situations, Yuri Perez has given up a ton more home runs and extra base hits last year. So listen, in my opinion, Yuri Perez is not is not proven at this point. Can you trust him? We want to believe that we can. Coming off the back of Tommy John after a small stint at the big leagues where he looked great, but at times felt like he could be lucky. Do you trust him? I don't know. So that's Sandy. That's Yuri. There's question marks over both. Lazardo, is he, he going to be here? Probably not. Ryan Weathers, do you trust him? Maybe, maybe not. Trevor Rogers, do you trust him? Probably not. Edward Cabrera, absolutely not. Braxton Garrett. I mean, all of a sudden, for me, I'm looking at this rotation. And on paper, if they pitch to their ceiling, it looks sexy as hell. However... Gut feel is there's a lot of question marks here, and some guys are not going to pitch to their ceiling. And actually, this rotation, whilst from a Marlins fan base perspective and my own perspective, because I'll be tweeting about it tons, it looks sexy as hell. Young studs up and down, but with so many question marks. So many question marks. Does it really matter in the grand scheme? Does it really matter for 2025? I don't think so. I want to talk about that right after the ad because. Are the Marlins in a rebuild? Some fans, I don't think, believe we are. I think some fans believe that this is a a regular, let's sell off a few you know, expiring deals and then let's spend some free agent money this offseason and let's go again. I think that's still where some fans' heads are at. Which, I mean, okay, maybe that's going to be the case, but I think, I, th- I think, the majority are not seeing it that way. So when I talk about that a little bit more depth, like Smoke and Joe Rosaro equally went off on Jeremiah's uh, Marlins nine pod. So I just want to talk about that. It blends into this topic. So we'll get into that. Before we do that, guys, uh, it's time to let you know about our good friends, as I mentioned already, and sponsors of this show of <coughs> Tax Network USA. Man, I almost uh, swallowed a fly then. Uh, here on Locked on Marlins, we pride ourselves on getting you The latest news for your team, whether it's the offseason, the draft, spring training, or the playoffs, it's year-round. You know what else is year-round, right? Collection season. Just because tax season is over doesn't mean the IRS will stop coming after you for unfiled taxes. The IRS can garnish your wages, levy your bank accounts, and even seize your property. Don't let the IRS target you. Let the licensed professionals, and tax experts at Tax Network USA go to bat for you. And with over 14 years of experience and an A-plus rating by the Better Business Bureau, Tax Network USA has saved their clients over $1 billion in tax debt. Whether you owe taxes, have complicated matters that require tax planning, or finally hit that parlay this season and need help correctly filing. Call 1-800-549-1000. 
1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on. See the link in this episode description below. All right, guys, final segment here with me, Peter Pratt, on Thursday, the 13th of June. A lot of Braxton Garrett talk. Let me know your thoughts about Braxton. Is this a blip? Is this who he is? Was 2023 real? Is 24 more like the Braxton Garrett we should expect? Who do you trust? Looking forwards in this Marlins rotation. A lot of question marks. Frankly, there's question marks over everyone. I didn't even mention Max Meyer. There's question marks there too. Even though Max... Max has only pitched a handful of games and I think is still like the th number three on the war list for the Marlins this year. I mean, that just sums it up for the Marlins that Max Meyer is still like a top five, top three player for the for war for the Marlins. Crazy, crazy. The defense didn't show yesterday. We've seen that before. We've seen it many times this year. You know, if this club is to progress to the levels they want to in the future, Pitching and defense will always be a huge part of this organization. The pitching feels like it could be on shaky ground. The defense has absolutely been on shaky ground. So wait to see what types of profiles the Marlins target and develop later on in the, in the coming years anyway. Let's just talk about the rebuild topic for a final segment here. I wanted to just get into this because someone brought it up on Twitter they weren't happy about my episode yesterday, the fact I want to talk about trading multiple relievers, the way I, I think multiple relievers could be moved. Why? Just, well, if you haven't listened to yesterday's episode, reminder, the Marlins aren't in it this year. They won't be in it next year. The Marlins don't really need any shutdown relievers. Those guys, anyone that's performing at this point, irrespective of contract status, particularly the ones in arbitration, should be moved at any stage. The Marlins aren't competitive this year, and they won't be next year. I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced. Someone asked me, why are you obsessed with selling anyone? Let's just add to this roster. The core is there, etc. We're not in a rebuild. I just put it back. I said, oh, we're not in a rebuild? Question mark. No, we're not. Please define a rebuild. I'm like, okay. I feel like we're going to have to cover this ground again. Guys, I just want to sign it now. The Marlins are in a rebuild. They're not using that word because no one uses that word anymore. But they are. And the way I define that is if you start to trade away your best players that have control beyond the current season. The current season, they're not going to do anything. Peter Bendix acknowledged that. But if you start trading players that have, and the best, your best players, and they have control beyond the current year, then you're in a rebuild. You are signaling that actually next year they don't expect to compete either. The guy we're talking about is Luis Arias. He had control for this year. Okay, that's cooked. But he also had control for 25. The signal that Peter Bendix has given to the fans by that move, by moving Luis Arias, is that we won't compete in 24 or 25. Guys, I don't know how more blatant it is than to say that the Marlins are rebuilding. They're going to be in the lottery for two years in a row, in all likelihood. They are going to be in this year. Next year, who knows? Next year's roster could look different, but it may look different because Griffin Conai may be in there, Victor Mesa Jr. may be in there, a few other guys may be moved. Who knows? It's probably going to be a relatively young-looking roster, which could be quite fun and exciting, but frankly, it's going to be full of untested young dudes, and there'll be some fun storylines in there but frankly, it's not going to be a competitive roster. It won't. There's already murmurings of them trying to trade Lozado. Again, if you're trying to trade your best pitchers, at least the healthy ones, with years of control beyond the current season, then you're in a rebuild. That is what's happening. It is what's happening. Smoking Joe Prasar, let me know your thoughts. I mean, I, I try to, you know, how do you define if someone's in a rebuild? For me, I feel like that's the really easy way to work it out. If you're selling dudes, even multiple dudes, that have years of control beyond the current year, which may be lost, then you're rebuilding. I get it. Moving expiring contracts makes a ton of sense if you're dead. Every club does that. But every club does not sell 
their best players with control beyond this year if they're not actually prioritizing the future, which effectively means rebuilding. It does. Smoke and Joe Rosaro on this uh, uh, Marlins 9 pod. Like I said, go and check it out. Him and Jeremiah have got a real nice hookup going on that one. And Jeremiah hosts it perfectly where you, and sometimes you need to understand when to sit back and let your guest do the talking. And Jeremiah does that perfectly in this episode. Smoke and Joe, as we've seen on Twitter, he's had a lot to say about the way this offseason played out, the way that the Marlins are handling the communications. He goes as far as to say that he believes the front office, Peter Bendix, the Marlins, are liars. They are lying to the fan base. That's how far Joe is going with this one, that they've been lying to us. I'm a fan. And I think in reality, that's correct. The Marlins, and the reason they're lying is, and, and the, the example he used is, they're lying to season ticket holders. They were telling them a story in the offseason. The campaigns they were building around were building off a postseason. Skip it. They already knew Skip was effectively gone, lame duck manager, but no, they still campaigned around it. They were selling something that wasn't real. They were selling a product that was not real. And the reason they were doing that was because they wanted the money. They want to try and sell as much as they can to recoup as much money. as, And there's no accountability there. You sell something that isn't real. You know, any other line of business, you know, there's an inquiry into that, right? You know, you're up into, you know, whatever, I don't know the equivalent for in, in the States, but, you know, that'll be investigated by, you know, local regulator or whatever it might be. So... Go and listen to the episode. Go and listen to Joe. You may not agree with everything that Joe says, but I thought it was really interesting that like Joe is that far in terms of talking about how the Marlins and their the, the PR and the comms and the marketing have all been effectively, they've been lies. Lies. Driven by the need to sell tickets, to sell season tickets, etc. We all know what it is now. We see what it is now, but it's too late for those guys that committed X number of thousand dollars for season tickets because they were hoping there was going to be a playoff run driven by Skip Schumacher. It wasn't real. It wasn't real. Joe's going to be on this show real soon because I absolutely love Joe. And I'm in lockstep on this one. Like The way the Marlins have handled this, the way you know, we, everyone just wanted some transparency. We wanted some honesty because we can buy into that. I think what you end up with is, you know, listen, we're about to head into a general election at this point in, in, in the UK. So, you know, new prime minister may be in place in, on the 4th of July, July, actually, is the vote. Um, and what you have right now is a load of politicians campaigning for your votes. And it's all lies. No one believes anything. No one believes anything they're saying. What people want it's just honesty and transparency, but you never get that from these guys. And unfortunately, at times, with Peter Bendix in front of the media, it kind of feels like we're drifting into that area of like, no one believes anything you're saying, which is discouraging. I'm sure Peter Bendix is a real nice dude, and I'm sure he's really switched on. But the fan base, the consideration has to be the fan base. And... I think in reality, he bottled things. He bottled it this offseason. He knew what he wanted to do. He was just scared to tell the fans. Who are the main stakeholders here? They're the main stakeholders beyond Bruce Sherman and the ownership group who are responsible for, you know, turning a profit in their investments. The next stakeholder group is the fan base. That's who he should be accountable to. And he bottled it. He wasn't open. He wasn't transparent. And that's created already a fracture. We're only a few months in. And already, in some portions, Peter Bendix has lost the fan base. He has. 
Wild Saints. Thanks for making Locked On Marlins your first listen, guys. I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow as we recap a Mets series and we continue on in this Marlins rebuild. I look forward to seeing you then.